Welcome back. That was a great synopsis and summary of the surgical uh, minimally invasive side of treatment of the surgical side of the anti-reflux disease. When we talk about surgeries, we also always talk about redo surgeries in patients who need reoperations, and that's always a, a difficult topic because it's a difficult operation. And for that, we have a very experienced surgeon, Dr. Chris Morse. He's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a senior thoracic surgeon at Mass General. Over to Dr. Morse. Thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm going to talk about redo anti-reflux surgery, and I thought I'd start by showing a pretty common barium swallow of folks that present after anti-reflux surgery with what appears to be a slipped fundoplication causing significant dysphagia. We're going to go through a couple of things today, <clears throat> the patterns of failure, the causes of failure, the preoperative evaluation of these patients, and then look at the surgical therapy afterwards. Well, the reason we're, we're, we're seeing so many more um, redo procedures is because of the increasing number, at least a number of years ago, in the number of anti-reflux um, uh, procedures performed. And I think this was with the advent of laparoscopic anti-reflux surgery. There were a lot performed, often for marginal symptoms, and there are pretty well-established failure rates. The open procedure is somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, laparoscopic probably around the same, although reported between 5 and 17 percent. Uh, percent. And I think a lot depends on your definition of failure and, and what your follow-up period looks like. Suffice to say, they do fail over a period of time. Many folks with recurrent mild symptoms after an anti-reflux operation can be managed non-operatively. However, between sort of three to 6% will require some sort of operative intervention. And this is often reported to be within two years of the original procedure. Interestingly, the presenting symptoms are a little bit different for those that have uh, an indication for a redo procedure. Initially, a lot are, are done for reflux, but ultimately it becomes more, less of a reflux and more, more of a dysphagia problem. And that's typically because the, the rap either slips into the chest or down onto the cardia of the stomach. So, that, so the symptomatology sort of transitions for the redo population. And very important to note is the success rate for reoperative surgery does not equal that of the initial anti-reflux operation. I feel like 95% of the time for an initial operation, if I choose the correct patient with the proper indications, I can get a successful result. However, I always often quote to patients about an 85% success rate for redo surgery. And every time we do another procedure, a third time, fourth time, although those are quite rare, that number becomes lower. So patterns of failure in reoperative surgery. Early failures are often technical errors performed during the initial operation. The fundoplication was either too loose or too tight, or the wrap was misplaced at the time of positioning. Late failures are often deteriorating poor gut motility, loss of peristalsis, uh, or wear and tear and unwrapping of the fundoplication. So in terms of misplaced fundoplications, this is when the cardia and the stomach are above the diaphragm and the wrap is placed around the cardia or the upper stomach rather than the esophagus. And this gives that classic hourglass appearance uh, when it's misplaced. The twisted fundoplication is, is when the unmobilized fundus is pulled tightly around the esophagus and this twisted the LES and the LES is seen as tempting to unwind and creates a obstructive effect. The two compartment stomach is, is when the point on the greater curve with which the wrap is formed is, is too low. And there's a portion of the fundus isolated from the antrum which shorts, forms sort of a band around the stomach. So it's sort of a two compartment stomach with a redundant fundus above the wrap. And then the slip fundoplication is when the wrap is placed properly at the time of the operation. There may have been some component of the short esophagus uh, and uh, quite quickly the wrap slips onto the cardia of the stomach, typically with retching coughing or some sort of uh, ill-advised um, uh, lifting and, uh, and it creates a slipped fundoplication. And the disrupted fundoplication, usually a late, uh, a late finding with a failed fundoplication is where there's a complete or near disruption of the wrap and recurrence of the hiatal hernia. There's no evidence of a, of a wrap present. Finally, the herniated fundoplication, 
This is when the wrap actually stays intact. It's on the distal esophagus. The grill repair typically fails. Maybe some component of a short esophagus and the wrap migrates up into the chest, creating sort of an hourglass appearance with the cruise of the diaphragm compressing on the sacardia. So typically, uh, the pattern of failure was transdiaphragmatic herniation, as Hunter reported in over 800 patients in about 85% of cases. And in those reported, in his report from an outside hospital, transdiaphragmatic herniation was 25% and twisted fund location 30%. So what, what he's saying is that in his, in his experience, most of his patients migrated transdiaphragmatically, but in the outside experience, a lot of them were poorly performed. And I think that speaks to the volume of surgeon and the quality of outcomes that you get. So the causes of failure, why these things tend to failure? Well, sometimes it's a misdiagnosis of the original problem. The initial workup was either incomplete or misinterpreted. There was some underlying motility disorder that wasn't appreciated or underlying achalasia, however unusual that is. Maybe the fund application, as we mentioned, was too loose or too tight. The bougie size was incorrect. There was no shoe shine maneuver or the positioning of the fundus around the distal esophagus. And possibly they should have performed a, a partial wrap with impaired peristalsis versus a full wrap leading to dysphagia. Pearl disruption can happen uh, leading to the herniation of the fund application. This is usually, as I mentioned, preceded by some sort of sentinel event, tearing, lifting, pulling, coughing, retching, that disrupts your pearl repair. There may be excessive tension placed during the primary suture uh, placement of the crua. I think a, quite an emphasis, at least to our trainees, that preserving the peritoneum overlying both crus is important when you're repairing them as it asks to serve a buttress. I do not routinely place pledged sutures for a routine anti-reflux operation, but I do believe that the peritoneum overlying the crus does act as a pledged uh, helping to prevent failure. <laughs> failure to recognize a short esophagus. As Dr. Bonin quite aptly pointed out, you need about two to three centimeters of intra-abdominal tension-free esophagus to work with to create your fund application. And a failure to appreciate this or wrap around a tension-free segment of esophagus will lead to transdiaphragmatic herniation or slippage of the wrap. The way I do this personally is I, I do mobilize the gastroesophageal fat pad, typically off the GE junction, to clearly visualize where the GE junction is and measure this closely uh, before I perform my wrap to make sure I don't have a shortened esophagus. This is something I do want to lengthen. And this is after significant mediastinal mobilization. Sometimes the laparoscopic approach, although it's the preferred method or a, lap, or a robotic approach as a preferred method, they both create new more peritoneum elevating the diaphragm and may give a false sense of an elongated esophagus. And when that pneumoperitoneum is released, the cruise comes down, the esophagus actually is more short than we appreciate. Sometimes it's traction on the GE junction. Some folks use a Penrose drain around the GE junction to tug down on the esophagus, again, giving a false sense of longer length. And then the bougie itself, as it's placed around the esophagus that we wrap around the bougie can give you a sense that you have a longer esophagus. Uh, then you may, and you may actually be dealing with a shorter segment of intra-abdominal length. So as I mentioned, I, I do spend some time mobilizing uh, far into the mediastinum. I do not worry about pleural entry on either side. I can work with anesthesia to get through that. And if I do sense uh, that there is going to be a shortened issue, I'll move quickly to a collis gastroplasty or wedge collis gastroplasty to, uh, to create a tension-free fundification over a segment of neal esophagus. So how do we evaluate these patients that show up for a redo procedure? Well, in the early postoperative period, a lot of these uh, symptoms are transient and frequently resolved. This dysphagia, bloating, and dietary intolerance, we just have to ride that out. And the initial workup is mainly conservative. Persistent dysphagia, which lasts two to three months, probably needs to be evaluated. I typically will dilate those patients if they present before I begin to study them. And again, give them a little more time to settle out. And an ominous sign after surgery is sort of their inability to tolerate secretions or any liquids by mouth right after surgery. And this likely represents either a technical error or some misinterpretation of the motility disorder. 
the late post-operative patient two to three years out with persistent symptoms, I will start an exhaustive clinical evaluation. I will set pretty uh, rigid expectations uh, for what to expect if we do perform a redo. And, uh, and these indications typically uh, for, the in, for the surgery or why they return to my office are heartburn and dysphagia. Uh, gas bloat and other GI symptoms are not an indication for, for uh, redo surgery, IBS type symptoms and such. One thing we do have the, the benefit of at MGH and, and I would take advantage of at your institution is an experienced gastroenterologist to partner with and then make sure you review all their prior tests if it wasn't performed at your institution to make sure you're not dealing with a motility disorder and make sure you review the, the operative reports to see exactly how the procedure was performed and, and look for other sources that may be contributing to the symptoms besides the wrap that's in place. Sometimes it's a previous dissection of the vagus nerve that led to some of their, uh, or injury to the vagus nerve leading to their symptoms. Sometimes it was not mobilizing the fat pad and seeing a short esophagus. Sometimes there was no bougie used but I think the operative report can give you some hint as to where to head. At a minimum for these folks, I will repeat an awful lot of testing. The barium swallowed it to further evaluate and assess their anatomy. So I get a chest X-ray just as a matter of course to see if I see a gastric bubble above the diaphragm. I do upper GI endoscopy on these folks as a way of sort of working, our, uh, working through the process, see what the wrap looks like, see if they have any Barrett's esophagus, see if there's any esophagitis, make sure there's not a cancer. We do repeat motility, we, we repeat um, pH testing, and I think critical is gastric emptying for evaluating whether there was a previous vagus nerve injury. This also gives you some time to work with the patient, discuss the implications of a redo procedure, set the expectations, which again is critical. The time of the operation, again, I perform an on-table endoscopy beforehand, looking for all the things I mentioned previously and to get a sense as to where the wrap is and what it, what it looks like at this point. And then <clears throat> we talked about manometry and pH, make sure they don't have some developing motility disorder and assess their LES. We'll keep moving here to the surgical therapy and how I approach these first time we do is at least to begin with. I start with an on-table endoscopy. I sometimes will place an arterial line and become less, uh, less it's become less common in my practice. I don't worry about a pneumothorax. Sometimes it's good because these patients can become a little hypotensive and it's not uncommon to enter a pleural space, uh, which I typically do not have to decompress during the operation. Uh, I use a, a, a 10 millimeter laparoscope, at least initially for better visualization. And I try to keep low uh, insufflation pressures, particularly if it's gonna be a long tedious dissection uh, to minimize the effects of the pneumoperitoneum. I try to free up the, the fundus. I try to mobilize around the liver. It's unpredictable where the adhesions are going to be. You try to work circumferentially around. If you're not making progress on the right side, I'll go to the left side. I'll go inferior. I'll go anterior. I try to identify the vagus nerves and I take down the wrap, but that's not the initial step. Uh, and then we will mobilize the previous quirrel repair and take down the fat pad if it hasn't been done already. I think the critical piece here is the, it's the last part of that slide, which is you must restore normal anatomy. It's not cutting one stitch. It's not putting one stitch in. It's not placing one stitch in the cruise or taking one stitch out. In my, in my hands and in my mind, if you're gonna perform a redo operation, restore normal gastric anatomy, take the cruise pearl stitches out and, and reassess and rewrap if that's your, if that's your goal. This is just a shot showing a, a very adherent uh, fundus of the stomach to the left lobe of the liver where we're not able to get even the retraction to lift up the left lobe and to, and to see the hiatus. Once I've done my dissection at the hiatus, I mobilize into the mediastinum. It's often this area is untouched. Uh, and again, I try to mobilize, avoiding the pleural spaces and not injuring a vagus nerve. This is just what it looks like. Old picture from a laparoscopic case, it looks like often like a meat sandwich, not terribly attractive, uh, and can be a little bit disorienting if you're not used to doing these redo operations as they can be somewhat bloody at times. One thing I do consider quite aggressively during the redo procedure is it calls gastroplasty, and this is because often this fundus, is, as seen here, will be rather beaten up 
because of their previous fundification and the takedown and dissection. And that will either give you a, a length of esophagus that you need or remove an area of, a, of stomach that is rather beaten up and not amenable to a wrap. This, this is the wedge gastroplasty. I put a bougie down, come down to the bougie with a stapler and then up along it to create my neoesophagus. Important to mention are the other options available, particularly this is in a third or fourth time laparoscopic redo. If the fundus or the stomach becomes unreconstructible, the two options are Roux and Y. I think that's a decent bailout maneuver. Uh, it is a good acid operation. And uh, again, this is a very rare occurrence, but I often will counsel patients, even at the first time that there are opportunities that we may not be able to reconstruct things and end up with a different form of their anatomy. The esophagectomy is also a bailout, but it's, it's, a, it's an ill-advised bailout procedure for a failed anti-reflux or redo anti-reflux operation, primarily because it's going to give you worse reflux than they had already. A low uh, intrathoracic anastomosis is going to lead to, to massive amounts of of reflux in a very unhappy patient. So yes, it can, it can get them back into GI continuity if needed, but I try to avoid an esophagectomy. Looking at some of the basic redo laparoscopic results, as we mentioned, uh, about an 85% uh, uh, success rate, and this has been reported on multiple studies. And to sort of drill down on this a little bit closer, one of the biggest studies is by Jim Lukacic in Pittsburgh, where he and Omar Awais reported on about 275 patients and again, they saw transmediastinal migration consistent with the hunter had seen in about 65% of patients. And they did a redo this in at about 75% and the addition of a colus gastroplasty in about 45%. Only a small portion got a partial fundification typically for impaired um, motility and there was no perioperative uh, mortality. Most patients had an excellent uh, um, uh, reflux quality of life score, about 85%, as is what I quote to patients now. So the key points, the indications are recurrent gastroesophageal reflux as studied extensively after their initial procedure and ongoing and progressive dysphagia. A comprehensive evaluation must take place before you enter back to the operating room, as we mentioned, pH, manometry, barium swallow, EGD, gastric emptying at minimum. Open or laparoscopic uh, is uh, re anti reflux operation or redo anti reflux operations are complex. And we didn't speak about open, but I do have uh, some experience with a third or fourth time redo the uh, thoracal abdominal approach. And so I'll make the appropriate sort of incision based on what I think the difficulty of the case is going to be. And I think with some experience and in carefully selected cases, you can have uh, pretty good short to intermediate uh, results. Thanks.